Hey guys, something a little different, sort of. It's TV related. Um, customer contacted me. Well, let me take a step back. I generally never throw anything away because you never know when it might be useful. Uh, some of you hardcore viewers may recall about three and a half years ago I picked up a Predict uh, pedestal chassis and pitcher tube from somebody local off a of Craigslist that repurposed a Predicta, uh, somehow thinking they might add more value to it, which is ludicrous if you know anything about Predictas, but that's what he did. But at least he saved the insides and I picked them up. Pritchard tube turned out to be a bust. We got a nice lake show out of it when I tried to use it. But I had the entire chassis and I put it aside. Well, flash forward, a few years and I started working on more and more predictors and I got tired of tripping over that chassis and I needed a few parts for some other sets I was restoring for customers so I started parting it out and then guess what happens somebody in the predictor group on Facebook gets a mint minty pedestal predictor with picture tube that we hope is good tuner no chassis completely empty inside I contacted him and said, hey, I'm pretty sure I have a chassis. You might be missing a couple odds and ends, but I should be able to patch it back up. And I'll restore it for you, ship it to you, and pop it in your set, and away you go. So, he just shipped me a tuner. Because um, I'm not sure if I have mine. So, <laughs> here's, the, here's the rub. I can't find it. <laughs> I have found some of the trim as I scavenged some of the controls from it and there's a mounting plate on the front I found the mounting plate and I found a couple of the controls I haven't found the main chassis yet I remember getting tired of tripping over it but I of course didn't throw it away and if I parted it out I would have saved the flyback and the vertical output transformer basically everything I don't know where they are. I haven't found enough bits and pieces to account for the whole chassis, so I still have hope it's around here somewhere. However, even if it's not, I do have two complete spare holiday chassis, which are 95% identical. One of the differences being the tuner, and he still had his. Uh, the other major differences are there are some custom mounting brackets because it's mounted differently. I have one of them being that control panel. I don't have the one that goes on the bottom that supports the weight of the chassis. I really hope I can find that. If not, uh, I have an, uh, another entire set I could use as a reference and fabricate the missing bracket. Uh, but that's certainly I can get I can get him a working chassis. We might be missing a, uh, or have to cobble together a, mount, uh, a mounting bracket or two, but otherwise. That's the plan for that. However, while talking to him, he uh, asked me about something else. He picked up a uh, Motorola set. Near and dear to my heart, I've restored so many of these. Uh, it's a VT71, I think it came out of. I think it's a TS4J, probably a late... In other words, the last incarnation of the eight or so variations they made of this chassis. And if you recall, I very recently restored a portable version of this set. So I said, hey, why don't you send it over and I'll see what I can do. So here it is. Uh, looks like uh, I'm missing a tube or two. Maybe they're in the box. I'll hunt around. And as for the underside... I already saw a peak as I was flipping this around. Wow, that's wild. It's been recapped, but man, when was it recapped? It's filled with Olsen oil con, oil filled miniature capacitors made in Japan. Olsen Radio Corporation. And they're odd because they are the old system, like 0.05 instead of 0.047. 
and their 600 volt instead of the more modern 630 volt. I kind of remember hearing about Olsen. So maybe this was recapped like in the 60s, I'm thinking. And they didn't do all of it. We still have all the ooey gooey high voltage caps and all the original electrolytics. So we'll be given this the full treatment. That's wild. It's partially recapped. I'll look for a day code on those. <laughs> Interesting too, because <laughs> a video I'm thinking about doing one of these days is about the whole outside foil uh, issue that uh, I'm seeing more and more people talk about, starting with Mr. Carlson. Um, the end, one end on this says outside, doesn't say outside foil, but I'm guessing that's what that means. Oil filled. No, these won't have PCBs in them. Uh, they're probably oil impregnated paper caps, though. Alright, so, <laughs> doing some spring cleaning down here, uh, getting rid of some stuff that's long overdue, I'm sorting through my cables and trying to get anything I don't really need out of here, and I'm hoping, really hoping I stumble across that pedestal chassis somewhere. You may have noticed in recent projects I've been slowly powering up sets before I start working on them. Not in this case. In those sets, they were all original. Or had very, had very little work done to them. This one's had a lot of work done to it, and I don't trust it. One thing in particular I didn't like was in the power supply, they had taken out the seleniums and replaced them with this cobbled together thing. It looks like a dual fuse holder. Took a top hat diode, soldered a, a thick hunk of brass to one end, popped it in this holder, which in and of, of itself isn't bad, but as I was having trouble uh, tracing out the wiring, so I just went ahead and installed adapter caps because I knew it was going to be anyways and put in all new electrolytics. Likewise with the uh, high voltage caps, these are always leaky. The originals were oil impregnated paper caps rated for 6,000 volts. Uh, one of them had already, has already been replaced with this guy, so I'm just going to go ahead and replace it. The circuit is very sensitive to leakage. Not only will it distort the waveforms for the four coupling caps, but for the filter cap on the high voltage, it'll just drag it down. So if you want to have any chance of getting an image on these sets, I suggest the first thing you do is review, possibly start restoring, replacing electrolytics in the power supply, and replace the five high voltage caps. Uh, and I'm, for the replacements, I'm using these VEMA caps, 6,000 volt caps, film, plastic film, 6,000 volt caps are a little hard to find. The only two choices I know of are these VEMA caps, which you can get from Mauser or DigiKey, problem is they're made for circuit board mounting, so they have little stubby leads, so you will need to attach extension wires, like I've done on this guy. Uh, they were out of 4700s, so I went with 6800s. The originals were 5000 for the vertical, the bigger ones, and for the filter cap, so I went with 6800. Going a little bit higher is no problem. A little bit smaller can be for the coupling, because you get... Um, you can get waveform distortion. There should be nice, sharp sawtooths going uh, through there. Uh, now I'm curious about these guys. I asked around online uh, if anybody had seen these before, and the only response I got was that they're uh, very prone to being leaky and bad. So <laughs> uh, I suspect these will be. I haven't seen a date code on them. Let's let's clip one out. I'll do this guy. It's easy to get at now. I'll remember when, where it uh, needs to get installed here to replace it. Olsen Radio. I kind of think they were a mail order firm like Lafayette back back uh, 50s, 60s. Olsen Radio Corp, Akron, Ohio. No date code, unfortunately, so we just won't know. 
so uh, let's check this guy for leakage. Looks like it has a like a rubber plug on this end and it's cracked, which is not a good sign. So it's a metal tube, and then this end is plugged up with some sort of like an O-ring or something that's deteriorating. All right, I'll get a uh, capacitor tester out. This should be uh, a 0.1 microfarad, good for 600 volts. I have it hooked up to my solar capacitance bridge. Let's start checking for leakage. Here we are, 100 volts. If the light flashes, we have leakage. The faster it flashes, the, f the more leaky it is. Well, it's leaky at 200 volts. Yeah, that's not good. We'll keep going. It'll get worse and worse. And here it is at 500, flashing like crazy. So it is certainly not good for 600 volts. That's for sure. As far as the value goes. I'm rock the dial here and watch for an eye open on the tube. Uh, C2 range. Yeah, it is about right about 0.1 microfarad. Depending on where it's used in the circuit, how it's used, that leakage might not be that much of an issue, but it is certainly not up to spec. And there are certainly circuits where that will be a problem. An oscillator might stop functioning, for example, or a waveform will get distorted because... There are some pretty large waveforms going to the deflection plates on the CRT where they're a couple hundred volts on the sawtooth and uh, if it's leaky, the, the sawtooth is going to start bending over and it will mess up the, uh, the raster on the screen. So I will be replacing those. So this is being re-restored. <laughs> when these caps are from... I'm just going by the appearance and the type of material. I believe this is oil impregnated paper. Uh, I'm thinking late 50s, early 60s, because you get in the later 60s or mid 60s, everything went to plastic film. And plastic film would not have been oil filled. So, if any of you are familiar with the Olson Radio Corporation or have seen Oil Con, caps like these I'd be very curious to uh, know something about their history oh one other little fun tidbit while I've been working on this especially soldering up in the area where the selenium rectifiers used to be I'm getting a distinct whiff of selenium as I solder the old joints <laughs> If you've never smelled a selenium rectifier when it goes up, when it burns out, consider yourselves lucky. It's a very distinct odor. Sort of skunk-like, but not quite. Uh, it's very pungent, very distinctive, kind of a metallic. It, it gets in your head, it gets in your nose, and it's hard to get out. And this is probably just the residue from decades ago. Only once... Have I had one go up in a room that I was in, and uh, I immediately had to air it out, and it took a few weeks for that smell to get out of the room and out of my head. So you don't ever want to burn up a selenium rectifier if you can possibly avoid it. I'm sure that's what happened in this set sometime in the past. Alrighty, I think there's enough done that we can try powering this up. I replaced the five high voltage caps and all the 4.7 meg resistors down here. While checking these, I discovered this guy was over 10 meg and this guy had been replaced with 100k. I'm thinking somebody was trying to compensate for this one being so out of whack by drastically lowering this guy. All this stuff is there for the centering controls. It controls the DC bias on the deflection plates on the electrostatic CRT. Uh, hence the centering controls. And in the midst of all that we also have the deflection signals being coupled to them. These lugs on the back of these pots don't actually connect to anything inside of the pot. They're just convenient mounting points for these DC blocking caps that couple the signal from the lower voltage oscillating tubes to the high voltage on the deflection plates. So there's basically two ways you can do an electrostatic CRT. You can have the deflection plates at a low potential, say a few hundred volts, and put the cathode at say negative 5,000 
or what they did in this case, where the cathode is a few tens or hundreds of volts, and the flexion plates and the final accelerating anode is like 5,000 volts. That's why we have all this mess here. Uh, and I finished rebuilding the power supply. And I replaced that one cap that we clipped out and tested. And there was another big old fat cap down in there. I think it was uh, yeah, this guy at 0.5. I just replaced that just to kind of create some breathing room. Alrighty. Uh, I'm going to flip this over and we're missing a bunch of tubes. And I want to double check the BIOS tube. It's still the original. Hmm. That doesn't sound promising. I'm going to dig up a uh, solid state replica that I made using diodes and power resistors. And uh, we'll put this to the side. If it's dead, and even if it's not, I'll, I'll give the owner an option. If it's not dead, yes, you can continue using it. But keep in mind, this gets really hot. That's why there's a sheet of asbestos uh, above it in the cabinet. Or I can replace the guts with uh, modern components that dissipates far less heat. I repopulated the two missing tubes. It was a 6AG5, a 12SN7. For the ballast, uh, I just happen to have a capacitive type handy, so that's what I've installed. Uses capacitive reactants to drop down the uh, current to the tubes. Um, it gives it a nice uh, soft start too when it powers up, so it might take a little bit longer than usual for all the tubes to light up, and as usual, using a green phosphor CRT. In fact, the owner just shipped me the chassis. I don't even have his picture too, but even if I did, don't want to risk damaging the precious P4 black and white type phosphor. And finally, I've rigged up just a cheapo modern 8 ohm speaker for sound. Here we go. Alright, everything's hooked up. Isolation transformer. It's not a hot chassis, but... Um, there's no transformer. There are circuits underneath that are right on the AC line. Okay. Checking out current draw and the distance on my ammeter. Ah, yeah, this will happen sometimes. <laughs> the 12AT7 tube is lighting up brighter than the other tubes as they slowly start lighting up. It will calm down. Alright, tubes are drawing current, current draw is going up, but it's like a little under an amp, that's about where it should be. Let's see. Just a hint of a crackle out of the speaker. Obviously nothing on the CRT. Don't have any knobs installed right now. Oh, it's contrast control. Okay, so it's good that something's out of the speaker. Try turning the brightness. Well, that's disappointing. I was hoping we get at least a dot or something on the CRT. I also replaced the two caps uh, that were on the oscillator for the high voltage. Alright, well, let's shut her down. Hmm, sometimes a spot will appear when you shut it down. <sighs> Alright, so, let's do something simple first. And just, there's two 25L6s in this guy. Let's just swap them. Maybe the 25, I haven't tested the tubes yet. Maybe the 25L6 for the, uh, High voltage oscillator is no good. It's pretty darn hot too. Versus the 25s. Well, 25 L6s is this for the audio output, class A. Not that hot. This the sucker's hot. Very hot. But uh 
Yeah, I was thinking I, I checked and replaced all the res well, there aren't that many, the two or three resistors and the two caps on the high voltage oscillator circuit. Still plenty of things that could be wrong. Uh, haven't even looked inside the high voltage box, heck for all we know. There's not even a high voltage tube, rectifier tube present, but uh, we'll get there. Let's just do the simple thing first and swap these two tubes. I'll uh, probably be replacing this 12AT7 at some point, too. So you may have seen versions of tubes like uh, 6AU6, and there's the 6AU6A. The A versions are the ones that are meant to be in series strong sets because they have a controlled heater time, a warm-up time. This is probably not an A version. That's probably why that's happening. Okay, looks like we probably still don't have any. High voltage, that's okay. Uh, we'll check inside the high voltage box, and uh, we can certainly get a high voltage probe out and start checking a few things. But hey, as far as first power up goes, that's not so bad. All right, a few changes. One, although I built that ballast, and I'm pretty darn sure I got it right and it works fine. Just to eliminate that is a potential issue. I installed a rare, very, very hard to find glass ballast that uh, was made for this set that I know is good. And let's see, I hooked up a uh, NTSC signal source and I popped the cover off the high voltage box. And I noticed that there's a, a feedback ring around the high voltage rectifier and it's all the way down that should be up higher so I'm gonna lift that up and see if it will help it's weird so the oscillator needs positive feedback to keep going the way you get the positive feedback on these is they actually have a circle of wire a loop an inductive pickup loop around the high voltage rectifier tube to feed it back into the side and you're supposed to position that such that you get maximum output, peak efficiency. It still could also have a bad uh, rectifier, high voltage rectifier tube. Well, let's see, let's see if that made a difference. kind of weird. Only half the tubes are lit up. That means that something's not right. One of the tubes isn't seated right. One of the tubes is bad. That was could be bad. That's weird. Let me put my ballast back in. It's one of the goofiest things about these sets and causes a lot of confusion and problems is that is that ballast? No, the current draw is too low. Until right away something's not right. Alright, here's a new 12 AT7. That was it. Whoa! And that's glowing really bright too, and that is worth the commercial ballast installed, so. Oh! And, well, I guess that was the issue with the high voltage, was the, the position of the stupid uh, feedback. Now that, 
crazy patterns because I do not have the shield on the thing. Well, of course, now I gotta turn it off and slide that feedback coil all the way down and see if I can recreate it not working just to verify that that indeed was the problem. All right, feedback coil all the way down. Let's try it again. I had, <laughs> if I had nerves of steel, I would try sliding that feedback coil up with the set energized. I'm not feeling that <laughs> that risky today, so I just turn this set off, and slide it back up, and let's go again. Wow, there was enough juice left in the set that <laughs> just came right back up. Huh, so whoever was working on this, or maybe in shipping, maybe in shipping, the vibrations... That coil sits on there pretty tight, um, but somehow or another it got knocked out of position. Okay, let's see if we can uh, pick anything up. That speaker's awfully quiet. It's on my channel. I'm going to pick it up. It should be around here. Well, looks like we have zip for reception. Let's put this back on and you'll see what a difference it makes. And I wanted to point out that there were only three screws holding it down. Uh, that, that's pretty typical. Uh, normally, originally, there were four on other sides there. There were ten screws holding this down. It's really common for all of these to be gone because the only way you can get at them is with the CRT removed or shifted out of place. Uh, you gotta take out the 25 uh, L6 to get at this guy. And there should be one on the back. So, <laughs> you imagine if you're servicing this to take all those off and move all the tubes out of the way, if there's problems and to go back and forth, that's where the screws gonna get, don't get put back on. I finished with the recap. Those last few capacitors, the uh, Olsons, and uh, I want to do paper caps. Let's give this a try. Been checking resistors as well, and I noted there were some low value resistors 56 and a 68 ohm cathode resistors in the IF strip. They were two, three times the value they were supposed to be. So I, I do want to go back and replace those at some point. I wiggled the 12AT7, that seemed to make quite a bit of difference. You're definitely getting snow. <laughs> I'm gonna switch the channel on my RF converter. Ah. Oof, not very good, but it's reception. So I, I just don't know what channels this TV is set up for. I think that you always get two. I think that's hardwired. So I'm feeding in channel four now. That's not very good. But at least it's something. <laughs> it's the first time we've seen anything on this set. And we have some sound. It's a vertical hole. Horizontal hole. Oh, oh, oh. Hey. And we we have a picture. 
Oh, is that my imagination or is that video backwards? <laughs> Oops. Methinks I uh, wired up the horizontal plates backwards. <laughs> Boy, that is that is terrible. Well, crap, because you know what that means. I may have to go through and do the RF front end alignment procedure, <laughs> which is not much fun <laughs> to set up the channels. Ah, uh, boy, I, I will crudely attempt to just do it by sight, since it's already so far messed up. Uh, let me grab a twiddle stick here. So, it's these guys. will be a bank for local oscillator and a bank for a bandpass filter. Okay, I was off a little bit. Here it is from the front. So we have the antenna, RF, and then the oscillator. So the first two banks are for uh, um, bandpass. And then the back is for the oscillator. But curious that the, you only get to do the uh, antenna coil and RF coil for one, two, one channels one through six. Uh, I believe the the reason is that when you get to channel seven, the frequency is a couple hundred megahertz, and I think that's factory preset. Whereas these are 50, 60, 70 megahertz. And then so there's the oscillator. So. Uh, I would have thought this set was new enough it doesn't have channel 1, but I don't have the cabinet, so I don't know. Well, no, it's an 8, or, no, this is a TS4J. It's kind of a late addition, so I don't know if it has channel 1, but the slug layout on top of it matches up with that. Anyway, so channel 1, 2, and then 3 or 4, 5 or 6, 7. So, this would should be the guy that I want to adjust. To do the oscillator, anyways. So I don't know I'm in the right ballpark if as soon as I tweak this. Now, let's try this guy. That does. Okay, yeah. So let's see, we're in the second position. Okay. Tell you what, I'm going to switch to channel 3 because I want to get 3 and 4 working. I think you can do that with this. I could be wrong. No, nuts. You get channel 2, then 3 or 4, then 5 or 6. Um, I'm going to try to get it working for 3 anyways, and I'll try to bend the next one over. Maybe I have enough range I can maybe squeeze 4 out of it. There's 3. Oh wow, that's way better. Oh my god, that made a huge difference. Let's see. I'll try this. It's making some difference. Now, you're not supposed to do it like this. You're supposed to feed an RF sweep generator, get a scope, and check the band pass. But, <laughs> considering how bad it was, I figured we had nothing to lose. Sound is really weak though, so I don't think I have things quite right. I got back underneath the chassis and reversed the two horizontal deflection plate connections so things are now going properly left to right. I tweaked the sound a little bit by ear uh, on the sound IF coils. And the set's playing pretty well. However, 
I align this visually and by ear, I have no doubt if I go through and do the published service info's alignment instructions and procedures, it will play better. So that's what we're going to be doing next, but not in this video. I think this is a great place to leave off. We got the set working. That's fantastic. Before I do an alignment, which is going to be a delicate, tricky thing, I want to clear off my workbench and get some different equipment up here. I need to get a sweep generator, marker generator, XY monitor. I will go over it as best I can. I've been asked to demonstrate alignments on TVs a number of times. It is very, very specific to every chassis. Some are quite different. <laughs> However, I'll be doing a number of them coming up, so it's time to get some equipment out. I need to not only align this, I want to do the Stromberg Carlson TC10 and the Westinghouse H225. So be looking for some alignment videos coming up. For now, this is it. Thanks for watching.